Welcome to part 2. Next, we will be discussing on the management and treatment of dyslipidemia. When we are discussing about the management, it would include the non-pharmacological and pharmacological therapy. Therapeutic lifestyle changes is the foundation for CVD risk reduction both prior to and after commencement of lipid-lowering therapies in all individuals. This is especially important in obese individuals, smokers and those who lead a sedentary lifestyle. TLC would include dietary modification, exercise and stop smoking. For dietary modification, it will be discussed in the following slides. For exercise, the duration of exercise for CVD prevention in healthy adults regardless of age is at least 150 minutes a week of moderate intensity or 75 minutes a week of vigorous intensity physical activity or an equivalent combination. Smoking should be discouraged and individuals referred to quit smoking services. Discussing further about diet, this diagram illustrates to us the proportion of fat as macronutrient intake in a day along with carbohydrate and proteins. Dietary fat is essential to our health, but some types of fat may play a role in cardiovascular disease. In addition, fat is also high in calories. Recommendation in healthy adults, total carbohydrate is about 50 to 60% of total calories intake with emphasis on whole grains. To reduce intake of refined carbo foods such as white rice. In the presence of high TG and low HDLC, carbohydrate intake should be lower. Total fat intake is between 20 to 25% with an upper limit of 30% of total energy intake. Protein intake is about 15 to 20% with emphasis on vegetable protein. Explaining further about fat, fats in diet consist mainly of TG, which is made up of three fatty acid and a glycerol backbone. Fatty acids further categorized as either saturated or unsaturated fats depending on number of double bonds. Unsaturated fats can either be poly or monounsaturated fatty acids. Omega fatty acids are part of polyunsaturated fatty acid. Oils are mixtures of fatty acids. The predominant fatty acids present in common dietary oils are coconut oil, palm kernel oil, santan. These are saturated fatty acid. Corn oil and sunflower oil, these are PUFA. Olive oil, canola oil and palm oil are MUFA. Taking PUFA or MUFA for example 1 teaspoon of olive oil or virgin coconut oil without cutting down on saturated fat intake will not confer CV benefit. For dietary modification, saturated fat should be less than 10% of total calories. It should be replaced by unsaturated fats or complex carbo. Dietary cholesterol should be kept to less than 200 mg per day. Impact of dietary cholesterol on serum cholesterol levels is weak. However, many high cholesterol foods also contain high levels of saturated fats for example meat, full cream dairy products, and some processed foods. Trans fat are created through a process of partial hydrogenation. Major sources of trans fat are deep fried fast foods, margarines and commercially baked cookies. Repeated or prolonged heating of MUFA and PUFA may convert them to trans fat. Trans fat increases the risk of CVD more than any other macronutrient on a per calorie basis. The intake should be kept at less than 1% of total calories. This is another way of showing what we usually call as the bad and good fats in our diet, their effects. On LDLC, total cholesterol and TG levels, and some examples of food sources. Dietary therapy is aimed at optimizing lipid levels while maintaining a balanced diet. For further detail, please refer to your local dietitian. Next, we will discuss on the target of lipid levels. The primary target of therapy is LDL cholesterol. The priority is to lower the LDLC levels to goal because data linking lowering LDLC with reducing cardiovascular disease are extremely strong. Statins are the first-line lipid-lowering lo drug. Statin therapy should be intensified to achieve LDL goal before considering combination therapy. If the target LDL-C is not achieved with maximum tolerated dose of statin, combination with azetamibe is recommended. 
for very high-risk patients. PCSK9 inhibitors can be considered if maximal tolerated dose of statin and azetamib fail to achieve LDLC targets. Secondary targets of therapy are non-HDLC, HDL, and the TG levels. Patients with TG more than 4.5, when LDLC cannot be calculated, non-HDLC becomes the target of therapy. Diabetic patients already on maximum tolerated statins and having low HDL and high TG greater than 2.3, fibrates may be considered to reduce the CV events. This slide is showing the target LDLC levels based on the patient's cardiovascular risk categories. This table is available in our CPG dyslipidemia and very relevant to our clinical practice. The value stated should be used as our reference when we want to initiate pharmacotherapy and the target LDLC levels after therapy was initiated. With the new evidence coming, our latest 6th edition of the Type 2DM CPG stated new LDL target levels for diabetic patients. For diabetic patients with established CVD or other target organ damage or three or more risk factors, they will be in the very high risk categories and the target LDL level is now less than 1.4. Patients with diabetes for 10 years or more without target organ damage and any other additional risk factors they are in the high-risk category, and the target LDL is less than 1.8. Moderate risk is those diabetics aged less than 50 years with duration of diabetes less than 10 years without other risk factors. Their LDL target is less than 2.6. In the next few slides, we will be discussing on lipid-modifying agents. In cases of secondary dyslipidemia, efforts should be made to correct the underlying cause before drug is initiated. In general, most individuals in the low and moderate risk groups can be managed by TLC alone. Occasionally, lipid-modifying agents may be necessary to achieve target levels. Only statin has been studied for primary prevention. For those in the very high and high-risk groups, it is recommended that drug treatment be initiated simultaneously with TLC. There are six major groups of drugs, but for the purpose of this presentation, we will focus on the first three. The first group is the HMG-CoA reductase inhibitors, or the statin group. Statins have consistently been shown to reduce CV events, safe, well-tolerated and cost-effective. Statin reduces LDLC up to 55%, and it has moderate effect in reducing TG and elevating the HDL. Since cholesterol is biosynthesized in the early morning hours, statins with shorter half-life, for example simvastatin and lovastatin, should be administered with evening meal or at bedtime. In contrast, statins with longer half-life, such as adivastatin and rosuvastatin, can be administered during the day. Statin is contraindicated during pregnancy and lactation. If pregnancy is planned, statin should be discontinued. Full monitoring after statin initiation, if the LDLC target is achieved, same dose of statin is maintained. The drug should not be stopped. The lipid profile can be repeated at 6 to 12 months interval. If LDLC target not achieved, statin dose can be up titrated to maximum tolerated dose. If target still not achieved, non statin drug can be added. As statin can affect the liver function, hepatic transaminases should be monitored at baseline and at 1 to 3 months after starting treatment or following a change in dose. If levels increased prior to therapy, other causes such as fatty liver or hepatitis should be ruled out. If it is due to fatty liver, lipid-lowering therapy is not contraindicated. If after initiation, ALT increased to greater than three times upper limit of normal, on two occasions, the drug should be stopped. Usually the level will improve with reduction in dose or cessation of drug. Cautious reintroduction of therapy may be considered a close monitoring after ALT has normalized again. Once patient is stable on statin, routine monitoring of ALT is no longer recommended. Another adverse effect of statin treatment is muscle symptom. 10 to 30% patients report statin-associated muscle symptoms, which includes myalgia when the CK is normal, myositis when CK is raised more than upper normal limit, or rhabdomyolysis when the CK is more than 10 times upper limit of normal. In cases of myalgia, if symptoms are not tolerable or progressive, 
statins should be reduced or stopped. Incidence of myositis and rhabdomyolysis is low. More likely to occur in individuals with complex medical problems or those taking multiple medications. We do not routinely measure CK in patients on statin unless if myositis suspected. If level is greater than five times upper normal limit on two occasions, drugs should be discontinued. Another issue is statin intolerance. This is when patient is unable to tolerate at least two different statin due to muscle-related symptoms that began or increased during statin therapy and returned to baseline when therapy discontinued. If statin myopathy is suspected, the first step is statin discontinuation for two to three weeks. If symptoms do not resolve, unlikely to be statin-related and patient should be continued on the same dose. If symptoms resolved, the statin dose can be reduced or decreasing the frequency to less than daily. An alternative dosing such as EOD or twice a week with adovastatin or rosuvastatin can be used. Other option is to treat with highest tolerable statin dose in combination with azetamibe. 92% of statin intolerant patients do well with a second statin. 73% will tolerate a rechallenge with a third statin. Care should be taken when prescribing high doses simvastatin of more than 20 mg per day together with drugs that inhibit cytochrome P450 as this can increase risk of muscle injury. In clinical practice, we have few statins to choose from. Basically, high-intensity statin gives greater percentage in LDLC reduction and thus reduces CV events more than moderate-intensity statin. High-intensity statin therapy is for very high and high-risk patients. Lower-intensity st statins also reduce CV events, but to a lesser degree. Generally used for primary prevention. The table is showing examples of types and dosage of low, moderate, and high-intensity statin therapy. This table can also be used as reference for statin conversion. Second lipid modifying agent is the cholesterol absorption inhibitors. Izetamibe 10 mg is available in the MOH formulary, and the prescriber category is A asterisk. This drug selectively blocks intestinal absorption of dietary and biliary cholesterol and other phytosterols. This leads to a reduction in hepatic cholesterol delivery. This drug is usually used in combination with statin if target LDLC is not achieved. It may be considered as monotherapy in patients who cannot tolerate statin. Another lipid modifying agent used in our setting is the fibric acid derivatives, or commonly called as fibrates. Two types available which are the phenofibrate and gemfibrozil. Fibrates are peroxisome proliferator receptor alpha agonist. They reduce serum TG effectively and increase HDLC modestly. Use is limited for the treatment of patients with very high TG not responding to non-pharmacological measures. ALT should be monitored at treatment initiation or when the doses are increased. Fibrates increase risk of myopathy when combined with statin. The risk is highest for gemfibrozil, which is 15 times higher than phenofibrate. Therefore, combination of statin and gemfibrozil is discouraged. Risk of myopathy when combining statins with phenofibrate seems to be small. Fibrates should preferably be taken in the morning and statins in the evening to minimize peak dose concentrations and decrease the risk of myopathy. When talking about cardiovascular disease, we are quite familiar with primary and secondary prevention. Primary prevention is the prevention of occurrence of CVD in people without the disease i.e. directed towards healthy individuals. We have to determine their risk for developing atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease and modifying the risk factors. Majority will be in the low and intermediate risk. TLC should be emphasized. In most primary prevention, statin therapy is sufficient to lower the LDLC. In secondary prevention, strategies are directed at individuals who have established CV. In stable coronary artery disease, statin therapy should always be considered irrespective of LDLC level. The target LDL is less than 1.8 or a 50% reduction from baseline. In ACS, early initiation or continuation of high-dose stat therapy soon after admission for ACS is safe and improves outcome regardless baseline LDL. Post-PCI 
all cardiac patients post revascularization should be on long term statin therapy. In CVA, statin should be considered in all individuals with previous non cardioembolic ischemic stroke, or TIA. The last segment of this presentation will be discussing on hypertriglyceridemia. Hyper TG has modest association as CVD risk, but the association is far weaker than for hypercholesterolemia. There have been no randomized intervention trials with sufficient evidence to recommend specific targets for TG. Four targets of therapy. The primary target of therapy remains achieving LDLC goal. If TG is between 2.3 to 4.5, the secondary target is non-HDLC. If TG is greater than 4.5 millimol per liter, the primary target of therapy is also non-HDLC. Mild to moderate elevations of TG, i.e. greater than 1.7 to less than 10 millimol per liter. Treatment should include lifestyle changes, weight reduction, low-carbohydrate diet, control of diabetes or insulin resistance, exercise, reduction of alcohol intake and cessation of smoking. Drug therapy should be considered in high-risk individuals. Two options to achieve targets. Intensifying statin therapy especially if LDLC is not achieved. Adding fibrates as a combination therapy to statin. However, there is no outcome data that show a reduction in CD events with the use of drug therapy to reduce TG. Severe elevation in TG of greater than 10 millimol per liter. If asymptomatic, repeat fasting TG after interval of 5 days, but within 2 weeks. Review potential secondary causes of hyperlipidemia and seek specialist advice if TG remains greater than 10. Drug of choice is statin. Fish oil contains long-chain omega-3 polyunsaturate fatty acid can also lower TG. Doses 3 to 4 gram per day can lower TG by 20 to 50 percent. Very low carbohydrate and low fat diets of less or equal than 15 percent of total calorie intake and, and lifestyle changes can be part of treatment. If pancreatitis is suspected, treatment includes fibrate or nicotinic acid. Severe hyper-TG associated with uncontrolled diabetes warrants IV insulin infusion. IV insulin stimulates intravascular lipoprotein lipase that helps to clear TG at a faster rate. The TG level will improve within two to five days, but may not normalize. So, finally, before we end the talk, these are the take-home messages. Dyslipidemia is a risk factor for cardiometabolic disease. The cardiovascular risk of an individual should be assessed at the initial visit to guide treatment direction. LDLC is of cardiovascular disease and should be the primary target of therapy. Secondary target of therapy is non-HDLC, HDLC and TG. Statin treatment has proven benefit in reduction of cardiovascular risk. These are the references for this module. I hope all of you have benefited from this presentation. Have a nice day ahead. Thank you.